Our scripture this morning, uh, we're going to start a new series or new book. We're going to go through 2 Peter. And so that's found on page 1207 in your pew Bible. That's 2 Peter, and we're going to be in chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. There it's written. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Here ends the reading of God's word. If you'd join me in prayer. O holy God, May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've noticed something recently, and I think a lot of it has to do with, since I've turned 40 a few months ago, I've noticed that I have a feeling and that I feel like I say a lot, you know, the world's really gone into a terrible place. And, and maybe, maybe that comes with age, that you notice that, you know, it's not all sunshines and rainbows. Or, or, or maybe it's, you know, I can't do as much fun things as I once could do when I was younger and get away with it, right? It, because because the, truth, the truth is, the world is a messed up place. The world we live in today is very messed up. But it's not so unique that, that it's just us, that, that all of a sudden nobody else in the history of, of the world has ever gone through such a terrible time as this. We just now have technology to check in on the other half of the world to see that it's just as bad over there as it is here, right? Be, because I would imagine that, that if now is the only time that the world's this bad, then who is Peter talking to when he writes this 2,000 years ago? For you see, the time we're living in now is being referred to as the post-truth era. Right? We're living in a post-truth era. And, and this is a direct result of postmodern philosophies infiltrating and permeating everything about us and our culture and our mainstream thinking. Now, this, this didn't happen because all of us are sitting around reading 19th and 20th century French and German philosophers like Derrida or Nietzsche, right? We, we don't keep those books on our nightstands. I'm, I'm quite positive and good for you for, for not doing that. But because we put such a premium on on college education, the, the ivory towers have led us down a road of, of this postmodern thought and philosophy. And whether you took philosophy classes in college or not, or you know someone who went to college, the postmodern philosophy has influenced your life because postmodernism comes down and says the way we look at life and the way we understand the world around us is really a narrative. We understand it through story. And that in this story, in this narrative, there's a greater narrative that has played out the same through history, and we're all a part of it. Now, side note, it's not God, right? They're not talking about God and the narrative of Jesus Christ, but that there's the narrative that plays out over and over again through history is that there are people with power, and there are people without power. And as this this thought has gone through time, it's molded itself to where there are oppressors and there are those who are oppressed. And that in doing so, what's occurred in the culture is that we have been convinced that each person has his or her own truth. And that it is impolite to say someone is wrong, right? You laugh, but, but, but we know it. We, we're starting to see it, right? Facts are now debatable. 
right? The, the, the people we, we thought were gatekeepers of facts and truth, are, their integrity is being questioned, facts, truth. What is truth? What are the facts? I mean, I mean it's, it's not odd for us to have a conversation with someone and say, well, you know, my truth is this. And you're going, wait, what, tr- your truth? What, isn't it our truth? Like, isn't truth just, a, a, truth is either truth or it's a perspective, right? I guess just being an old curmudgeon, that's me living my truth, right? That, that's how it would go. And so what we see is this world guided today subconsciously by this narrative of oppressor and oppressed. And that there then comes this race by everyone to claim their truth as part of being oppressed. As if this claim brings greater validation. I've been part of an oppressed group. And if we feel left out of being in an oppressed group, well, now we're being oppressed because you're categorizing us as oppressors, and that's oppressive to do so. I mean, I mean and, that's, and, and this is the, the postmodern truth that we're walking along in, in, in this maze of, of trying to navigate life. And so what we need desperately as people and as, as Christians in this world today is direction based on clear truth according to real knowledge of God. So Peter writes his second letter. And we think, well, 2023 is pretty specific to us. Yet we're going to go through Peter's letter over the coming months, and we're going to wonder how 2,000 years ago he could write such a specific letter. See, as he writes this letter, his, his purpose isn't pastoral in this letter as it was in the first letter. We, we, we've just finished through per, First Peter this spring and early in the summer and, and concluded that. And Peter was pretty pastoral in that letter, encouraging, hey, you're, you're in exile. It's really hard. I understand it's really hard out there. Keep the faith. Keep working hard. Stay true to God, right? It was a very pastoral and encouraging letter. That's not what his second letter does. Peter's pretty combative and argumentative in his second letter because what he's done is he's not softening any blow, but he's cutting everything up with the edges of the sword of truth. For you see, this letter is meant to remind us of the truth of Jesus Christ. Peter, along with other apostles, wanted to provide direction to all of those who would come after the apostolic age. It's it's around 65 AD when Peter writes this letter. Other apostles have already died. He's about to die in the next three years. Peter is going to be martyred by Nero, killed for his beliefs in Jesus. And, and, And there's a real worry that... The truth of the gospel is going to get watered down and taken advantage of, and the truth will no longer be there for us to see. And so Peter writes a really forceful letter. And throughout this letter, what we see is Peter describing the differences between what is a true knowledge of God and the ideas that are being offered up by false teachers. And so it is that in a world such as today of subjective truth, as Christians, we need the direction that Peter is giving us on living and also how to answer the questions we're going to face and that we're going to face about the gospel. Because with every day that goes by, what we do and gather and worship and read the Bible and pray and fellowship together looks stranger and stranger to the outside world. It doesn't make sense because they no longer count the word of God as the truth. So what Peter does in his letter is he addresses some of those questions that we're going to face. 
right? A question like, can someone come to know God without knowledge of Jesus as God's son? I mean, that question has real implications. And, and depending on where you're at in life, there, there may be a time where you've uh, uh, given excuses to allow someone to be like, well, you know, I've got Jim. Jim's a really good friend of mine. He's a good guy. He, he works hard. He, he tries to do the right thing. I'm not sure he knows about Jesus, but he's a good guy. He's, he's going to be just fine, right? And part of that is that we don't necessarily believe that they're okay without the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. But if we can make room for them to be okay without it, then it lets us off the hook for ever mentioning Jesus to them, right? And now we've given space for their truth and the truth of Jesus to coexist, and both of them are now valid. And we sit here and we realize, did I really do that? It's one of those sins of omission. Right? We, we, we try and make some of the things that, that the word of God tells us and say, well, it doesn't really say that. So therefore, I can let myself off the hook or I can let my friend off the hook who I think is a good person. And, and God surely wouldn't give us strict guidelines on what it means to be a Christ follower. Right? He'd give us a wide gate. But Jesus says differently. Jesus says that it's a wide gate that leads to destruction and a narrow gate that leads to the truth and to life. And so Peter un unabashedly says in his letter that true knowledge of God must include belief in Jesus as his son. And that has real application in our life today. And it matters how we understand that and, and how we're able to stand on that stable ground in a world where someone will tell us, well, that's your truth. Let me tell you my truth. Other questions we'll face, such as, can can one know God and yet abandon the rigorous life the apostles required of those who profess Jesus? Right? Again, to those guidelines. Like, are those really strict guidelines that the scripture gives us on how to live, on, on what's acceptable, what's unacceptable, on what's considered pursuing holiness and what's considered ungodly? And throughout history, at different points in time, we've said, well, you know, this sin isn't that bad of a sin. There's worse sins out there. And we kind of flip-flop and change them around. And, and you know, there, there comes a time in self-help where we say, you just got to be you. You got to do you. And, and, and all we're doing is lying to them, selling them a bill of goods that, that never lead to fulfillment. For what Peter would say is that, that if, if we know God, yet we're abandoning the rigorous lifestyle and, and, and purposely not trying to stay in the guidelines God has given us, then he would say that we're denying the master who bought us and that we're forsaking the right way. But how can we know that if we're not standing on the bedrock of truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ? And then there's another question. Can we know God and reject the notion that Jesus will return? I mean, quite truthfully, most of us live that way. I mean, we may believe he's going to return, but we're quite certain it's not happening in our lifetime. Right? We look back and we say, you know, he, he died at age 33. He came back and was resurrected, then ascended 50 days later. And he hasn't been back since. So the chances of him coming back today aren't great. So I'm okay. And, and we give ourselves a pass. If we do believe Jesus is coming back, we're, we're not too concerned that it's ever happening in our lifetime. When in reality, if we look at this, and Jesus promised he's coming back, the Peter and Paul and the other New Testament writers believe Jesus' return was imminent, then if he hasn't returned yet, then we are closer today than ever before of Jesus' return. 
And yet our lives simply do not reflect that Jesus will return. So Peter confronts this question, not only this question, but says Jesus will return and Jesus will return as a righteous judge. It's strange how how Peter 2,000 years ago sees and knows that in a world of controversy and alternative views on the gospel, that when those exist, that we will need reliable footing, that we will need a sure foundation in Jesus Christ. And so what Peter aims to do here in his letter is he aims to establish and and to strengthen and to stabilize us as Christians and as the church in the true knowledge of God. So Peter begins. He writes, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Seems like an ordinary introduction, but if we recall back to 1 Peter, and we can flip over a couple pages and look there, when he writes that, he writes Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Second letter, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Two names, two titles. It bears and brings a different tone to the message. Right? Simon is, is the, his name given at birth, transliterated into Greek. It's his Hebrew name given at birth, transliterated into Greek. And then Peter is, is the name that Jesus gave him, and in Greek, meaning the rock. But here he is giving both of his names. And it's significant. It points out to us that he is a man with a history, a man with a track record. And in doing so, we meet a man who's willing to display both the man that he was born and the man he is today because of the grace of Jesus Christ. And suddenly, we understand Peter and his life differently. No longer are we putting him up on this pedestal of of this great apostle Peter. We could never do what Peter has done, but Peter has just said, I too have a history and a track record before Jesus. And since Jesus, it's been all about living into the grace Jesus has given me. And the cool thing is we, we read the Bible And we see that from the time he's come to know Jesus and the grace of Jesus, he has not been perfect. He's messed it up every which way. And he says he's both a servant and an apostle. Telling us as Christians in the church that he has both served and led the church for Christ to stand for the knowledge of God and the truth of Jesus. And by putting these names and these titles together as he does, we now have a man who knows both the fullness of guilt and of grace. So Peter writes this in his final years. Soon he'll be martyred by Nero. So this serves as almost his last will and testament. And it may well be Peter's final writings before he passed. So maybe that's why he writes with such force, with such bluntness about the truth of the knowledge of God. But there's something else that goes with it. You see, in Luke, in chapter 22, that's where Jesus and the disciples gather for the Passover meal in the upper room. And they're there, and they, at the Passover meal, they, they hear the story of Israel's salvation from Egypt. And then we get Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper, my body given 
my blood shed. And they have that meal together in the upper room. And as soon as Jesus is done instituting the Lord's Supper, in, in, in Luke's gospel, what we have next is quite the discussion amongst the apostles. They begin arguing which one is the greatest. Think about it. They, they just recalled their salvation as Israel from Egypt. They just heard Jesus himself institute the Lord's Supper, my body given, my blood shed. Hey, Peter, you know I'm better than you. I'm the greatest. Jesus corrects them and, and, and finishes that argument. But, and in the same breath that he finishes that argument, in Luke 22, verse 31, he then turns to Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter is then adamant that he will lay his life down with Jesus and follow him all the way. And Jesus then foretells that he will deny him three times before the rooster crows. And so it's some time, years later, after all of those decades serving and leading the church of Christ, that one final time, he pins a letter to strengthen us. Because that was the instructions Jesus gave him. And strengthening is what we need today. As we began earlier today, and I discussed with you that truth is now debatable. It's no longer objective. It's up for grabs. We need to be strengthened in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. Because we live in a time where for whatever reason we have valued our lived experiences over God's word. Regularly, our feelings on what is right or what is wrong or or what is truth and what is not comes in conflict with what God's word says. And the easy thing is for us to dismiss God's word and to say, well, you know, this is my truth. Folks, your feelings will lie to you. Your feelings, yes, they are true. They, they are your feelings. They are true feelings. But they will lie to you and color a circumstance, a situation, a part of your life in a way that simply doesn't record the truth. And for us as Christians, what we are to do is when we come to reconcile our lived experience and feelings with the word of God is to not dismiss the word of God, but to bow before it and turn to it as our source of all truth. And so Peter intends to strengthen us in that manner. That that if we have stumbled or lost our way as a church, as Christians, that what Peter gives us in his second letter are clear instructions, clear directions on the truth of the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. And so what sounds like an ordinary greeting to a letter, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What sounds ordinary, when we put it in this perspective, becomes a sweet prayer from the apostle. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord 
Jesus. Amen.